Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Hi, I'm Rod Stollhauser, Director of Marketing here at SVN Rock Advisors. And we've got an interesting topic for you today. And before we just kick into that, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping, a few announcements just to kick things off. For those of you that are uh, looking for information on the Western Marketplace, Alberta specifically, of course, next week we'll be bringing part two of this webinar series to you live. And as we move into May, we've got the opportunities for restructuring new apartment construction financing. In fact, we just finished a uh, speaker planning session and some great, great information uh, from a few great insider um, resources. So we're looking forward to sharing that in May. And of course, we're going to end off the year with our live event at the Toronto Real Estate Forum. We certainly look forward to that. Now, today, as we progress into our webinar, uh, one of the things I want to encourage you to do, just use the chat box. If you've got any questions, pop them right in the chat box because as the other panelists are not talking, they'll be they'll answer it live. You don't have to wait to the end. If we do have time at the end, we may do some live Q&A, but to get your questions answered with certainty, please use the chat box and we will get that all handled for you. Similar to the recording, after the webinar uh, later today, tomorrow you'll receive um, just notification that uh, the recording of this will be available on the landing page, the same landing page that you registered from. Um, so for the you know for people that have missed it or somebody that you recommend needs to see it, uh, you'll have access to the recording. Now here's the agenda. So today we're gonna, just going to walk you through. We've got uh, um, three of us that are going to be sharing with you. We're going to obviously just introduce kind of the the whole idea of the crisis and just kind of frame it a bit. We'll move right into like order of importance, you know, and in, in, in terms of the opportunities, we're going to talk about office conversions. Um, we're definitely going to talk about CMHC and that continues to change and evolve. And I know a lot of people are using it. Some people are frustrated with it. Some people are stacked in, the, in a queue with it. But at the end of the day, understanding CMHC is going to be a big part of this, of course. And we're going to dive into some financial modeling and uh, the HST incentives and how performers are functioning, not functioning. What are some of the things to pay attention to? And then going into the federal and municipal incentives in terms of what to look for, or maybe to even arm you with how to have some of those conversations. And we're going to complete the solution because, um, you know, this housing crisis topic is not just a single element. It's not just one thing to fix it. It's not one solution to get us through it. Um, and that's really what today is about. It's about how do we solve it? How do we put a dent in it? And where are the opportunities? And I think those opportunities are very, very important because, you know, I, I know some people may think, well, why would you have a title of a webinar called Solving and Profiting from this Crisis? And the reality is, I think at the end of the day, we know that things will only get solved when the private sector is really, really empowered. And guess what? Developers like yourselves are not going to develop if there's not a good reason to do it. And financially, it's got to make sense. So profiting has to be there. In fact, I believe with the right <laughs> nudge and the right information, most municipalities, most levels of government would understand that if people profit, people will do. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. Now, helping me here today, we've got uh, Fran Hohal. She's our Director of Research and Dave Price, our Director of Sales. They're going to be joining me and, and many of you will know them. I know you can see them in the... Uh, the Zoom windows, and you can manipulate, by the way, for those of you that are maybe not as Zoom literate as others, you have you have the ability to, to either just see the speaker, you have the ability to see a gallery, uh, you get to control that on your own computer, but uh, um, we will continue to just move forward with slides, et cetera. In fact, I'm going to kick things off with just a general introduction, and I think the idea here is to let's just all get on, a, on the same page with respect to understanding the crisis but I will frame it. I want to frame it from the perspective of the buyers and renters, not from our perspective, not our perspectives as consultants to developers, as developers yourselves, because we already will see through that lens. But we believe that there are two critical elements. And, I think, and again, this is not rocket science, but I just want to get it all framed together here. We know that the affordability of ownership and the affordability of rents are the two big buckets. That's a no-brainer. And I believe that, you know, I'm not going to go through statistics and show you tables we know that you know getting it down to the lowest form factor of single family housing, we know what's been happening to the price in there. We know, I mean, for those of you that have gray hair like me, maybe your first home was two, three times your income like me. And you know, nowadays, I know my son bought his first home just last year and it was somewhere in the 10 to 15 times income. And I think logic is out there to say, I don't think housing prices are ever gonna come down to the point where it's two or three times you know, the income for my children and yours. And likewise, I don't think their salaries are going to increase at a pace to allow them to make up that difference either. So at the end of the day, the tackling of affordability has to come through different thinking for sure. We know that. We'll talk about a little bit about that later on. Similarly, on the rent side, 
Um, we're, we got the right audience here. That's that's all about what we're primarily here to discuss. I think that we talk about rents, the demand is, a, is again, a no brainer. Now, why are why is the demand for rent really there? Yes, we know that, that there's a supply issue and that's probably the main issue we're, we want to talk about, but we really have two big contributing factors. Number one is if our children, the younger generations, and maybe even just others that are financially out of the market are not buying, we all know what they're doing. They're gonna be renters. And similarly, you know, we live in a country that is founded on immigration and will continue to be founded on immigration just economically. Uh, that, that is a given as well, but those are the pressures that apply to the demand and rent supply, uh, especially for those of you here in Southern Ontario, there are different markets and there's different cities like Calgary that have addressed it at different paces and have had different impact positively with, with interest rates, whereas negatively maybe here in the GTA. So again, geographically, the rent supply and, and the pace at which rent supply is being addressed. But I think in general, the coordination of programs, the, um, the what we've lived over the last few years of the, the COVID uh, scenarios and what's happened to labor and uh, supply chains and so forth, it's obviously been a settling of that, but that all contributed to the ability to execute upon the rent supply issue. And, and that's obviously what affects the, the affordability uh, factor here. So again, we're just talking about the idea that this whole affordability crisis has two components. It's, it's ownership and it's rents, and they are intimately connected as we've just gone through here. So let's just move right into our first topic. Uh, that just kind of sets the stage for here. And we're gonna talk about this topic of office conversions because they definitely have a place. Now, I'll be the first one to suggest that office conversions are not the tip of the arrow for the solution of our housing crisis. But it does have a place in certain communities, in certain cities, in certain demographics and scenarios of where there are uh, where there are office building issues and lack of supply. And, and of course, the whole pandemic um, just magnified that challenge. Now, about a year and a half ago, we ran a, a two day in depth. I think we had like fifteen or twelve different speakers on a, um, a whole in depth deep dive into apartment conversions. We centered around Calgary because Calgary is the role model for our country. And what I wanted to share here for just a couple of minutes before we move forward is what were the big takeaways? Because they worked well in Calgary and there were some lessons learned and there are things that other municipalities can learn from that as a role model. Now, certainly it says right here, the municipality needs to want it most. This typically is not going to work when it is a developer um, push forward initiative, unless they've got a compelling reason for it financially and or end user. But typically it is a municipality that has a challenge and they're looking to solve that challenge. In Calgary's, in Calgary's uh, situation, it was, you know, main streets just emptied of, um, you know, office towers that no longer had any uh, occupancy at all. So they had a, a pressing need to do that. They wanted to rejuvenate it. And what they did learn was that incentives are essential for the numbers to work in terms of the pro forma that was there. But here were the two big takeaways. Number one is someone, in this case, the municipality, had to take the responsibility for stacking programs, federal, provincial, and obviously a big component at the municipal level. But bringing them together and presenting it back to developers in terms of here's what we're bringing to the table to help you is definitely step number one. Step number two that was required that made it a success in Calgary was the issue of timeframes because timeframes equals money to the developer. And so what they did is they created a direct to permit process that allowed the development and conversion process to happen virtually instantaneously once the projects were selected. That was their, actually they felt that that from the developer's perspective was the number one impact. And you know what, knowing best architectural styles, the other big takeaway here is you have to know what form factors work best. And the good news is, is that uh, there is technology that is helping us. Now, Gensler um, has a great system. We work a lot with them and we have them speak a, a lot with us as well. But there are ways to determine whether a building is a good candidate, is not a good candidate, and what it would take to make the numbers work, both technically and financially, for the candidate building. And they spend a lot of their time right in Manhattan, dealing with Manhattan's issue in terms of doing this. So they, uh, the analysis process is available there to learn whether a building can actually work. And the good news is it does work. This is an example of just one of the projects uh, in Calgary, the Cube, that that's what it did look like and that's how it lives today. 
Um, that just shows a, a little bit of the fruits of the labor. And I, I think that was really what I got personally out of doing that one session uh, with these were the developers feedback where they just said the ability for them to build quickly with incentives made it, made it make sense. Because at the end of the day, it is much easier to develop, you know, on a piece of dirt rather than inherit someone else's uh, development, uh, if you will. So that's just a quick uh, um, uh, prelude into our in today's session. We're going to move right into CMHC, knowing the details can make or break a project's viability. Fran, over to you. Okay, thanks, Rod. Um, we'll start here. You know that CMHC has a number of programs. So we'll start with the uh, what's available to homeowners and and then small rentals that are really less than uh, four units in size. So CMHC offers, um, they basically offer a mortgage loan insurance product. It's to help Canadians purchase a house anywhere from, uh, you can get a down payment down as low as five up to 20% of the purchase price. And what that mortgage loan insurance does is really uh, it protects the lenders against default by the borrowers, which then in turn allows the lenders the ability to offer better mortgage rates. So those are the uh, these are the conditions here. You need um, a purchase price that is below a million, amortization up to twenty five years, um, and then the interest rates. Uh, we really have to pass the the test uh, in terms of uh, your gross debt service. Um, the percentage of your monthly household income that covers your just your housing cost, that can't exceed 39%. And the total debt service, that's, you know, your monthly household income that covers both housing and all your other debts, that can't exceed 44%. So they're able to offer you um, an attractive interest rate based on uh, going rates and so on with a little bit of a buffer there. There's also small rental loans. Uh, those are really designed to purchase properties that are um, uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and so on, um, up to four units in size. And again, it's similar to the home ownership one. Um, go back to the previous one there, Rod. Um, it involves, um, again, just, you know, the, the loan insurance programs for that. And then we move to the next one, which is... Um, you know, the products that are available for uh, rental housing construction, I've highlighted here in red, the ones that are available for uh, apartments uh, specifically, but you're looking here at the uh, affordable housing fund, a seed funding here. That fund is available to, it's for grants and contributions and loans and so on. Um, it's available to developers, municipalities, not-for-profits um, in order to create new affordable housing or just renovate existing ones. So again, aim to uh, increase the supply. The biggest one really is the apartment construction loan program, specifically related to, you know, the construction of new rental buildings. And those ones offer various, um, you know, fixed and uh, variable interest rates and, and so on. I can detail that further in a couple slides later. And then the other one that you're probably all familiar with is MLI Select, again, standing for multi-unit mortgage loan insurance, um, again, for properties that are five or more units in, in size. So specific to the apartment construction loan program, it used to have another name. So next slide, Rod. Um, since I think it was 2017, this program has committed about $18 billion in loans and supported the creation of 48,000 new rental homes. It's on track to help build another 130,000 um, by 2031-32, somewhere in there. So it's, it's, it's there to stimulate the development of purpose-built rentals. It's available to developers, private sector developers, not-for-profits, municipalities, and so on. Uh, but it's not intended for individual ownership like uh, like condos. So you can see here the the terms, um, term of 10 years, repayable, uh, loan to cost up to 100%, meaning CMHC could finance the, the entire construction 
uh, for the apartment building component, but 75% for anything that's non-residential. Amortization is up to 50 years. And um, and then uh, you've got some other uh, programs, that are, or sorry, some other uh, amortization periods if it's uh, different for uh, renewals and uh, renovations and so on. Debt coverage. Um, the debt coverage, so basically for every dollar of debt service, there has to be at least a dollar ten in net operating income generated by the property. It, for any non-residential components, um, you know, they might have higher operating costs or vacancy rates. They're a little bit more volatile in terms of their income streams. So the DCR on the, the non-residential components is higher at about 1.4. Um, on the MLI Select program, this is for new construction. It uh, utilizes a point system to determine and evaluate if your project is uh, eligible for it. Um, and it rates various aspects of, um, of criteria, I guess, if you will. Um, the affordability criteria on new construction, they look for anywhere from 10 to 25% of the units in the project to be priced at 30% of the median rate or income for 10 years. If the borough wants to exceed that up to 20 years, they get awarded another, an additional 30 points. Then you have energy efficiency. For a new build, they have to exceed um, the current standards, uh, which are uh, the National Building Code standards. Um, if they exceed the um, uh, reducing greenhouse uh, emissions and energy efficiencies by 20 to 40%, they get awarded points. And then you have um, accessibility where 50% of the units have to be accessible to get points there. And the loan uh, to cost is up to 95% of the cost. But the, the real key here is the minimum DCR of 1.1. So as I said earlier, you have to have net operating income of at least 110% of the property's debt service payments. So in order for them to have that kind of 10% cushion. Amortization periods are kind of in the range of 40 to 50 years here. And then they also offer this for um, MLI Select for existing properties. So on the next slide, Rod. Um, the criteria is pretty similar to the new construction, uh, but there's more emphasis here on the affordability requirements. So as I said, for new construction, it, they look to somewhere 10 to 25% of the units have to be affordable. On existing properties, that can be anywhere from 40 to 80% of the units being priced at 30% of the median renter income. So and if the borough wants to make a larger commitment there of 20 years, they again, get additional points. There's less emphasis here on the energy efficiency requirements. That's basically because these are older buildings that we're dealing with. So, you know, under new construction, you know, you're trying to um, achieve above the standards, whereas on existing buildings, CMHC looks for um, anywhere from 15 to 40% reduction in the emissions. Uh, the loan to value for new construction is, as I said, 95%, up to 95, but on existing properties, it's uh, 85 to 95%. So it just gives you a quick overview of the various programs, and we'll allude to some of the announcements uh, later in terms of uh, topping up some of these programs. All right, Dave, over to you. Okay, so whenever we get, uh, you know, get to talking about different uh, programs and all of that, we, we obviously want to layer that into our financial modeling and uh, how certain factors actually impact a, a project, right? Because it's all about product profitability. So, you know, talking about the HST incentive, this was a massive, massive announcement by the government and uh, originally was was stated, you know, as you see on the screen, it's talking about it being a game changer for many pro formans, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, you know, what the uh, program is all about and how it's changed. And uh, 
Uh, also look at a uh, the compar comparison between a pro forma before and after the HST incentive was announced and what a difference it makes. So let's start off by talking about what the uh, HST incentive is. So it's an enhanced rebate program, right? So most of you know that. Um, and it's applicable for uh, new purpose-built rental buildings that are starting construction on or after September 14th of 2023, right? So we all know that there's those developments that got started and what is the definition of starting construction, but the cutoff date is September 14th, critical, critical to know that. Now it applies to uh, any new construction apartment buildings that have four plus units, or if it's a student or seniors or for uh, people with disabilities, it's 10 plus private rooms. So. Uh, and also 90% of the units need to be designated as long-term rentals. So it's a rebate program, right? So we, we have to remember that. It's still a rebate pro program. It's been enhanced. The developer is still required to do the self-assessment. And, uh, and what that means is they've got to determine the fair market value of the res residential component of the building and then do a self-assessment on the GST and H HST on that amount. So... The uh, the new rental rebate is increased to 100% of the self-assessed amount. Now, that's a big change, right? Because uh, under the old programs, the rebate program, the uh, the federal portion of that, the GST, was, was allowable up to, as a rebate, 36% of the 5% of, of the uh, GST component. But it was also a phased cap that was in place at that time. Um, and on the Ontario portion, the PST, there was up to 75% available on it on uh, the 8%, and that was capped at $24,000 uh, per unit. Now it's a 100% rebate program. Huge, massive difference. So let's uh, flip into the next screen, and let's actually show you an example of what that means to a development. So... We did a project with a developer and it's a 140 unit purpose-built rental apartment development. And working through the financial modeling with this developer, um, we showed, well, we were working on this before the incentive was announced. Now, obviously that was great news because in the early days of this uh, project and the financial modeling, it really wasn't penciling out very well. And, uh, you know, when you look at it, so the original total cost on this pro uh, project with no HST, uh, with, with the HST as a uh, full impact on the project, uh, the total costs were 82,000, uh, 82.9 million, right? You can see that on the screen there. Now look at the difference, right? With no HST, that dropped the cost to 77.9, which is a variance of almost $5 million. And that goes straight to the bottom line on this project, right? So you can see the profitability before tax, you know, uh, sold on stabilization uh, had a, almost a $5 million impact to the bottom line. Now, look at what this means from the developer when you're looking at the uh, return on costs. So, you know, uh, under the uh, uh, full HST, the return on cost was 8.9%. That shifted to 15.8% or a 6.9% variance by HST alone. And again, I want to highlight, this is interesting, we've isolated the factor of HST incentive only and look at the difference it makes on this project. In terms of the internal rate of return on stabilization if sold, with HST, it was a 9% IRR, jumps to 14.4% or a 5.4% variance. Huge impact to developers. Um, the IRR over 10 years, it went from 10.4 up to 11.8 or an increase of 1.4%. Massive, massive impact. We'll show you a little bit more about the impact on this project. You look at the uh, financing rate, right? Financing went... Uh, uh, from 5.2 down to just over five, which is a variance of 187,000. On the tax portion, it's obvious, right? We dropped the uh, taxes down by 4.7 million. Um, so total 
total change in the development cost is just under $5 million. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means on your construction loan, you, you need to borrow less money. And why your financing and interest charges are so much less is well, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're uh, servicing debt on, on a much smaller loan. So dropping from 56,000 or 56 million on this project down to 51 million. So again, a major impact at uh, almost 5 million bucks. So let's look at uh, the next slide to talk about, uh, you know, what this means, right? So you look at projects where, you know, it's uh, designed to, so the HST incentive, the impact, right? It's designed to spark growth in rental apartment developments, right? And obviously you can see that uh, the biggest impact here is to developers that are, you know, yield driven developers, or the merchant developer, right? Projects that sat on or slightly below the margins, right? The, the profitability margin prior, prior to the incentive announcement may now meet the developer's risk tolerance threshold. And again, every developer is different in terms of what return metrics they look at or what their, you know, what their goals are for the project. But this could be the tipping point on many projects, like it was the case in the example that we show you, where this is a this is now a go for the developer because the return metrics make sense and it falls within the tolerances of the developer. So the enhanced rebate, it uh, reduces the, the financial risk by lowering the cost of construction and, and improving the cash flow of the project. But it also enhances the uh, financial uh, performance metrics like we showed the IRR and the uh, cash on cash returns. So, you know, this is really helping to push those projects that were either previously not a go or ones where a developer was sitting on the fence of whether they they still need to make some improvements. So big time impact. And uh, so, again, I mentioned this is like a sim single impact. Some of the other things that we want to talk about here, are the additional impacts that, uh, you know, developers are thinking about what what else is on their mind? What are they projecting for? And, you know, I think everybody is of the same mindset, right? Interest rates are expected to start coming down. Uh, the early prognosticators were uh, suggesting that interest, uh, the first interest rate reduction might come in the second quarter. And that's starting to look like more and more of a reality. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to make a, a, a another big impact and a big difference to the uh, uh, to the projections on a project and, and helping to get financing in place and moving these projects forward. The other thing, and, and you heard this a little bit from Rod and Fran already in uh, earlier slides, that stacking of the incentives is absolutely critical. And it's different in every region. And a lot of these things are tough to understand and tough to know which ones can be stacked with which. And if you get approved for one, uh, one incentive, does it exclude you from tapping into another possible uh, incentive at the various levels of government? Or, um, But some of those stackable incentives are the housing accelerator fund. So we heard last year that the first uh, municipality to uh, to get approved and, uh, and an allotment was uh, the city of London. But more and more communities are now getting allocated funds through the housing accelerator program. And this isn't just for um, this isn't just for uh, specific aspects of, of the uh, the development. It could, uh, well, it, it's definitely for the development, but it could be used for a number of different things. It could be used for servicing, uh, upgrading servicing on the property, uh, road improvements, infrastructure improvements that are going to help uh, uh, the developer get the project uh, going, moving forward, and really uh, start to cover some of the costs associated with the infrastructure and servicing around the building. But it also could be used to to help waive or uh, waive some of the uh, development fees on a project and that sort of thing. So it's a multi-use housing accelerator program that a developer, once the municipality has their allocation announced, they need to they need to make sure that their project is uh, in the queue, hand up, and uh, um, 
you know, communicating with the municipality to make sure that they are earmarked for some of those funds on their project. But you've got to demonstrate, obviously, that you're going to be able to use it to bring more units to the market quicker. But stacking of these programs is critical, right? We know uh, CMHC financing programs are as absolutely critical because of the ability to get lower interest rates on a project, longer amortization periods, and a higher loan-to-cost uh, ratio. But that can obviously be uh, stacked with that federal program, which is uh, uh, the Housing Accelerator Fund. Plus, what you're going to hear about now from Fran is some of those other municipal incentives. And some of these are stackable, right? So remember that. We showed you the example of the impact of the HST incentive. That's locked in. New construction, that's there. But look for those ways that you can build in some of those other incentives to make your project work. Brand, on to you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let's uh, talk about uh, municipal and federal incentives. And, you know, this this slides kind of depicts why we need them in the first place. <laughs> so um, a few years back, I can't maybe one or two years back, 27 municipalities in Ontario were actually assigned targets of over 10,000 units that they had to build over the next 10 years. So you can see here Toronto, has the highest target, of course, at 285,000 units. That's followed by Ottawa. Their target is 151,000 units. Mississauga has 120,000 and Brampton 113,000. And municipal partners, uh, you know, they'll, they'll point to basically, uh, it's usually the lack of infrastructure as being the biggest barrier to getting more homes built. So. So the Ontario government responded with, um, as Dave alluded to, a 1.2 billion uh, was called the Building Faster Fund, um, and which rewards municipalities that reach at least 80% of their annual targets. And they'll actually bonus you if those targets are exceeded. So the next slide gives you gives a little bit of a report card on where we are today. The, the slide on the left, shows you municipalities that were given um, what their 2023 target was last year and what their progress has been. So the blue being the target, the pink being the uh, what they achieved. So Pickering, Toronto, Kitchener, Milton, Hamilton, Brampton, and Barrie all kind of exceeded their targets last year. And Guelph, Caledon, and St. Catharines almost were above 80%. But then if you look at the one on the right-hand side, you can see those communities that haven't met their 23 target yet. So those are places like um, Oakville, Cambridge, Whitby, Oshawa, um, the list goes on. But you can see here, Oakville almost got there at 76%. But then at the other end of the scale, Burlington is trailing, only having achieved 27% of its 23 um, housing target. So I've identified on the on the next slide here, these, you know, there's probably more, but I've, I've just identified here 11 potential incentives that municipalities right across Canada could use to encourage construction of more residential units in order to, you know, tackle this housing crisis. Number one being um, dennis, density bonuses. So municipalities could offer developers the opportunity to build either taller, or denser buildings um, than they would normally be allowed uh, in exchange uh, for including a certain percentage of those units to be affordable within the, the development itself. Streamlining uh, the permitting process, so fast tracking it, that's gonna reduce both uh, time and cost associated with the construction. That could help incentivize uh, more investment in new projects. Waiving fees, uh, reductions in fees, um, uh, waiving development fees, impact fees, other charges, et cetera, that can lower the cost. Uh, tax incentives, so offering property tax abatements or reductions in newly constructed residential units, particularly you know those that are designed um, and designated as affordable housing because we all know how much the property taxes is on our income statement. Uh, then number five, uh, listed here, land use incentives. So 
uh, municipalities could provide incentives for developers to either repurpose underutilized or vacant land for residential development uh, by providing grants or tax breaks for redevelopment projects. Uh, six, three Ps, uh, so partnering with private developers uh, in order to build uh, residential units that can leverage more resources and expertise, spread the financial risk across the number of players. That could include like capital contributions from maybe the municipality in the way of land. Um, infrastructure investments. So we've talked a lot about this one, but you need to invest in transportation, utilities, public amenities, all of those things are are required to increase the attractiveness of the location for both the developers and residents. So as I alluded to earlier, Ontario has already responded here with a 1 billion municipal housing infrastructure program. Zoning changes, lots of pressure here in terms of updating zoning regulations to allow for more diverse uh, types of housing uh, like ADUs, we've seen progress here micro apartments, mixed use of developments and so on. Um, we've seen a lot of progress on, on this side. Zoning changes that um, this is what Rod alluded to that allow for office conversions. As Rod mentioned, the city of Calgary did incentivize, I think it was about $8,000 per unit um, to, to do that kind of a conversion. It was successful, but they're really the only municipality that is um, you know, has really gone gung-ho on this side. Uh, most of the cities that we've seen are really haven't been motivated to change the zoning here. I'm not sure the reasoning. It might be that, you know, that uh, residential taxes tend to be lower than commercial office property taxes, or maybe they don't want to uh, give up on um, employment lands and convert that to residential. I'm not sure there. Uh, but um, number... 10 grants and subsidies, um, providing those to developers or home buyers for you know the construction or the purchase of affordable housing units can help offset some of the cost. And inclusionary zoning policies. Um, so we've seen uh, policies being implemented uh, where a certain portion of the residential development has to include um, affordable housing units. And that should address some stuff. So you've seen provincial and local governments uh, streamline projects and, and ease the zoning restrictions. But still at the same time, I was reading this morning that Toronto um, recently, uh, until recently, 69% of all of its residential was reserved for detached and semi-detached homes. But really the type of homes that are required to address the the crisis is mainly rental apartments and, and student housing. So still some work to do there, but there is progress. And then uh, on the next slide, we everybody um, has heard over the last few weeks of uh, the federal government. This I've never in my history heard this pre-budget kind of announcements before. It was always wait for the budget, but the federal government has announced a number of incentives um, a lot of it is related to the housing crisis, and um, and they're announcing this ahead of the April 16th budget. Most of the funds are coming in the form of maybe uh, low-cost loans to build new apartment rentals. Um, there's a $15 billion top-up to the apartment construction loan program being announced to encourage uh, you know, the construction of more sustainable rental apartment projects. There's a new fund called the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund. That's six billion dollars. Uh, Ontario already has one billion in an Ontario Municipal Housing Infrastructure Fund, but this one is coming with a bit of controversy. Or you know, they're testing the waters here, I guess. But um, up to five billion in new infrastructure funding goes to the provinces, and this is designed for. Um, things like critical water, waste, storm sewer systems, and so on that can uh, support new housing. But it comes with um, having the provinces in turn have to meet federal requirements uh, for ramping up housing density. So like allowing construction of fourplexes or multiplex townhouses, 
uh, multi-unit apartments on land that's already owned and serviced without the specific need for municipal approvals. They're calling for a three-year freeze on any municipal development funds in communities that are over 300,000 and um, adopting changes to the National Building Code to support more accessible, affordable, climate-friendly housing options. So not sure how that's going to play out because we're already seeing a wrestling match here be about fourplexes in Ontario. Uh, but at the same time, you know, getting access to water services and so on um, can tack, you know, 50, 50 to $60,000 onto the price of a home. So we'll see where that plays out. The remaining $1 billion of that $6 billion fund is going to be directed to municipalities. Um, that's in this fiscal year only to address what they call urgent infrastructure needs um, for shovel-ready projects. There's also a $400 million top-up to the Housing Acceler Accelerator Fund that uh, Dave alluded to, and a new Canada Rental Protection Fund of $1.5 billion. That one's designed to help nonprofit organizations acquire more rental um, units across Canada and ensure that they uh, that they remain affordable. There's also a pre-budget announcement on, on the next, yeah, on this one where I think it totals 600 million, it's a $600 million package um, designed to build more affordable homes faster. So that, that includes 50 million towards home building technology and innovation fund. Um, so this is like uh, modular prefabricated homes and so on. 50 million to modernize and expedite home building through regional development agencies, 500 million to support rental, uh, housing, et cetera. Um, and then they're also launching um, some kind of uh, housing design catalog uh, where it'll have a standard, uh, I think there's 50, um, efficient, cost-effective uh, blueprints uh, that you can, housing manufacturers, province, territories, and so on, can use to simplify and accelerate the housing appro uh, approvals and construction timelines. So stay tuned. There's a lot of dollars. Not sure where the dollars are coming from, but um, stay tuned. That's April 16th, I think it is, uh, when we're announcing the uh, the the budget. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on that note, friend, I mean, just so everybody's aware, uh, the sixth is the sixteenth is that date of it. The following week, we've got a team of people that will do an analysis and deliver a specific strategy and information for apartment developers as it relates to what will be allow, uh, announced at that budget. So stay tuned. You'll see some emails and information. That'll be a free webinar, but that'll be uh, something that we will be launching to uh, the general audience. Now, the last topic we want to get into, we, we, it was one of our agenda items, was basically completing the affordable housing solution. So if we talk about the whole continuum, there's there's talk about that missing middle. And uh, th that is something that, that I just wanted to spend a few minutes on because the crisis as it stands, like we definitely know as apartment developers and people in that space, that that is a bit the biggest um, need for, for the rental supply. But it is a multivariate problem. There, the, it's size, it's speed. The speed to market's a, an important factor, and that led Derek and I to actually. And some of you may have already heard about the self-funding house. It was a a book series, and and the reality is, it's now transitioned well beyond that. Um, but we look at it as an affordability solution for both homeowners and developers, and, and that and that's one of the key elements we have. And as we said at the outset, you know, knowing that there's two big components. The idea of the self-funding house is quite simple. You know, it was originally written when Derek and I uh, conceived the idea. It was for our kids. It was for our younger staff who were in the same boat, which was there was that overbearing affordability question. How do you afford a house in today's market? And our book came to the conclusion and delivered it as the answer being treat your home as a business by becoming a landlord. And then the, the, the corollary to that is, well, how do you on the rent side of this crisis equation, how do we create more affordable rental housing but the key word here is quickly. Um, and that answer to that was, well, you know, Fran was just uh, alluding to that a few minutes ago as well by adding basement apartments or accessory dwelling units in different form factors. But typically basement apartments here in, in Canada is, is certainly one of the uh, viable solutions that uh, that we addressed. 
And I think what was important about this was really getting the mindset into the, the younger generations, into the prospective homeowners that were suffering from the impact of the perception of, I can't afford a house in today's market, which on the surface is true. And, you know, this is the visual that we like to, to really paint the picture of that mindset. And that is, take the average Canadian home at $750,000. Now, we're not talking about the GTA, obviously, here. Let's just use that as a number. Let's talk about 20% down. Just use that as a model. And let's use CMHC's, you know, recommendation of a third of your income, no more than that, going towards shelter. Well, that typical home would need a supporting household income of 180000 now, if that home had a rental apartment, like legal rental suite with a proper fire separation, egress, entrance, all those elements that, that are in place. And let's talk about a secondary market. Let's not go downtown Toronto or Mississauga or any other city. Let's go to a secondary market and say that's a $1,500 rental apartment. Now, all of a sudden, just from those same equation of one third of your income, it now drops 180, becomes 117 in terms of household income needed to support that home. Now, let's say the savvy person, young couple, whoever they may be, decide, hey, listen, I want to get into the market. I want to pay down my debt. I want to increase my equity. The basement will rent out the uh, the upstairs for maybe $2,500, $2,800, whatever that may be. But this becomes the visual impact that 180 that became 117 now comes down to roughly just under $60,000 of household income. Now, this is not mortgage qualification. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the impact of home income to support a house, because there are many other ways to support down payments and, and things like that. But the equation doesn't end there, because we, we live here in the GTA with the, the, uh, the, the investor crowd, shall we say, that invests in condos. We're starting to see them obviously leaving that market or dealing with challenges in that space. These can obviously turn into a rental situation as well, where it becomes investment and immediately becomes a, you know, a positive cash flow scenario. So regardless of that, we wrote these books and, and really to, to shape that mindset. And book number one you know, was just that, all about mindset. Book number two is actually going to launch here in a, in, a, in a few days, which is the how-to. And we we are not the experts in everything about this, but we partnered with experts. We, you know, we partnered with uh, Ken Beacondam, who's a personally and him and his company of, uh, um, you know, in the Hamilton, greater Hamilton area, have put in over 400 of these basement apartments in the last few years. Um, that's the how-to book. And that is meant to be the book that explains to the young person, the young couple, if they know nothing about how to vet out a contractor, know nothing about a renovation project, don't, don't know how to buy the right house and what it might look like. That's what that book was all about. And, and the book series is also supported by an online portal filled with experts, a landlord tenancy expert to handle that because we want to address the questions, the concerns, the fears that home ownership with a renter may be perceived as because all we hear in the news are negative stories about landlord tenancy and things like that. But we believe and know firsthand that this is a doable solution because this isn't being created by us. This has been around for decades. We all know that. So where this moved into was really moving into prototype success because one of our most valued and largest clients is a, also as a home builder division. And they, um, you know, back when interest rates did their thing, uh, I remember Derek was having dinner with this gentleman and he was talking about how new home sales came to a screeching halt, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago when interest rates did their thing. And when he explained, Derek explained to him that, hey, we're writing this book, two and two uh, equaled four that night because they said, why don't we try this out in, in your new home construction? And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, we launched a developer program and, we knew that it was vastly different. It wasn't just build it and wait for people to buy them. It required much, much more than that. And this is actually a glimpse of it. This is actually out in London, Ontario, and they even won a home builder's uh, award of distinction for, for this product. Um, we've had many sales of these units going into multiple subdivisions now in the London area and with multiple developers. And I guess the only reason I'm showing this is because that missing middle, that whole idea of a self-funding house, tackling affordability is a big way to change the mindset of people, move them away from rental, and really to fundamentally change their economic position for many, many people. But I just wanted to share one thing before we get to the concluding slide of that. There was a big lesson learned here. I've personally spent many, many hours of you know conversations with home builders here in Canada. And I mean, from coast to coast, not just here in the GTA. And some of them have built homes with basement apartments and only here only to hear what they did was they built a home put in a basement apartment and they didn't sell 
And the reality was is that we had to educate them what the difference is. And you know, long story short is we've created a unique system that creates a totally unique buying experience for the home buyer to help them through the challenges of the fears of having a tenant in their home, of how to buy that house, how to buy the right house. How do you actually take the community of homeowners of self-funding houses and get them to work together, learn, learn, you know, as a community? And that's exactly what we've been implementing in these communities. So that's that's kind of the scenario, what, what I want to talk about, because this is one place where timing becomes very, very important. Because, you know, here at SVN Rock Advisors, you know, we are apartment people. And that's what we do here on the left, you know, large, large new builds, you know, our clients are new apartment construction is what we're involved in. And this whole idea of the self-funding house over here is, is not what we do. Like we're not in residential, we're not getting into residential real estate, but we believe it's a very, very valuable component because of speed. And the whole idea of the self-funding house is to quickly address home ownership affordability and rent affordability. Because in those markets, for example, in London, those $1,500 one and two bedroom basement apartments, basically the, the market rents are almost double that in, in buildings. Of course, those buildings have amenities and things like that. But that is what we're tackling with the self-funding house concept and what builders are now implementing. So I think um, with that, I, I think we just move into, you know, what are your next steps? You know, you're here today, you know, we, we put this uh, webinar together to talk about the challenges of the crisis. We talked about solving it. We talked about making money with it. And I think that, um, you know, before I just uh, ask Fran and Dave to share just any concluding thoughts, I do want to give you access to Dave here, you know, because I do, I, do have, I have answered some questions uh, directly to some of the askers and we start getting into personal scenarios and situations and private projects and things like that. Just, just scan this or you've got Dave's, dave.price at rockadvisorsinc.com, email him. He can, you know, obviously have a conversation with you and, and that's what he does. He understands challenges and, and puts the solutions together or directs them to our team or our team of collaborators because we've got a whole network of collaborators that, it could, that can help solve those, uh, those challenges. So um, we do have a couple minutes here. I just want to say, Dave, Fran, any, any um kind of concluding thoughts, maybe pulling things together, maybe just something that would be a good takeaway for our audience. Dave, I'll just uh, ask you that question and uh, anything you wanted to share? Yeah, I think collaboration, I use that word. I think that's really important and leveraging the relationships that we have to bring them in to help solve problems is uh is key to what we do. And, and you know, Fran earlier talked a little bit about some of those uh well, quite a few of those possible incentives that are out there. And one of the ones, and it kind of struck me as we're having this discussion, the density bonus, right? So, you know, a developer is there working with the municipality to meet the objectives of the municipality, but obviously they've got to make their pro forma pencil out. They also have to take that pro forma into you know, the uh, the lenders, the uh, it, into CMHC for possible qualification into one of the affordable programs. But you look at from a density bonus, Fran had said that one of the trade-offs to that is often you have to, you have to, have to offer up some affordable units in that development in order to get that density bonus. Well, if you're looking at your pro forma and you don't want to offer up any affordable rents, but yet you do the financial modeling with an affordable program to see your interest rate drop significantly to help that pro forma pencil out, you can have a double whammy effect here of putting together a, um, a pro forma that has an affordable program to get the better interest rates, better amortization, or higher uh, loan to cost rate, but also get that increased density you're looking for. Because sometimes that impact of going up two more floors to uh, optimize that development to a greater density has a compounding impact to the developer. So the other thing is, is that when you're looking at these different things, talking about stacking and looking at different aspects, when you look at MLI Select or the affordable housing program from, from a financing perspective, if you can do an assessment, and I'm bringing in multiple factors here, if you can do an assessment of having your development meet the 40% more efficient uh, 
uh, approach versus the baseline standard, which Fran, isn't that being baseline against the 20, is it the 2019 standard? 15 and 17, I think. 15 and 17? Yeah. Well, if you can actually re-engineer the building to be 40% more efficient, not only can you get points on MOI, so significant points or all your points on energy efficiency, you're also having another knock-on effect, which is avoiding the carbon tax that's there or coming and the changes that the government is putting out there. So if you go into this with a well-laid plan with your strategist beside you, looking at what those incentives are, how they can be stacked and by qualifying for one, how that gets you access to another, like the density bonus, you offer up those affordable units, get your energy efficiency rating high, you get your better uh, your better financing rates, plus you get the increased density. Your yeah. pro forma just skyrockets from there. Anyway, I just wanted to make that point because these things are very, very directly impacting each other. Well, I'll, I'll turn this over to Fran, and, and I will answer the one question we do have here. I will address that after Fran. Go ahead, Fran. Yeah, yeah just following up on Dave, I, I think just the takeaway here is you really need all levels of the government, the municipal, provincial, federal, uh, the construction industry players, the developers, uh, the lenders, like the, the big banks, all of them need to be part of the solution to solving, you know, Canada's housing crisis. So, we, yeah. uh, you know, we have to work together to do this instead of there's some infighting going on here between different layers of government and so on. So uh, declare it a crisis and, and act accordingly. Yeah, for sure. And and with respect to, and I, I think I, I just that tack on to that, Fran, is that like what Fran went through with those municipality, you know, 11 points, you know, those, those actually become uh, um, a prep cheat sheet, if you will, before you go have discussions with the municipality. Remember, you can go in there and serve as a solution provider to municipalities. Many of the municipalities have targets they have to hit that are tied to that. So, you know, make use of those because that's valuable information. The question we received there, um, I totally agree with, and we know that the landlord tenancy laws here um, are, are very much uh, in in need of overhaul in many directions. But certainly, with respect to the self funding house, we already are having discussions to lobby for the fact that a separate set of rules for when the owner lives in the same building as the tenant is vastly different than 120 units sitting in a in a in a large apartment building. They are not apples and apples, and you know the message is there. You know, um, we are talking to a lot of major influencers. I'm going to be leaving here in another hour or so. I'm going to be downtown with one of the major banks um, and with, with Derek because, you know, them and their chief economists are, are very much wanting to promote the long-term solutions of large apartment buildings, but they're interested in that middle, that missing middle and ways to spur development and home builders beyond just apartment development as well. And it's catching the attention. Some of the largest companies that own major sports teams here in Toronto are wanting to talk to us about getting behind it. How can they help? So the good news is, I think it's a different climate today than let's say five years ago. There wasn't always the alignment of government wanting to solve a problem, developers and builders and private sector wanting to solve a problem, big business wanting to solve a problem, and they all are landing on the same problem. I mean, oh, I'll see, I died right now. But they're, they're, they are pieces of the puzzle on the table, and there's definitely room for improvement, but definitely opportunity that we feel is just around the corner because there's a lot of attention to it. So thank you, Dave. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah, for helping us out uh, behind the scenes. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. Remember, um, uh, the last week of the month, we will have that budget webinar. Um, that will probably be the next big follow-up to this. Hope you have a great afternoon. Have a great day. Enjoy this weather if you're in good weather today. And thank you very much for your time. Have a good one.